it's good to be with you again. Um, just got back from uh, Michigan. For uh, those of you who do not know, my wife, Jory, grew up in Chicago and their family always had a lake house in Michigan. Her parents uh, passed away a few years ago, so we now own a lake house in Michigan. Uh, so uh, we had a great time and uh, we... Uh, Probably the high point of the time was Erica, our youngest daughter, turned 16. Can you believe Erica's 16? And uh, so uh, the family that gathered kind of centered their trips around that. So we had Tad and Diana and their two-year-old Addie with us. And we had Luke from um, Kenya was with us and then Jamie. Uh, our 19-year-old, and then, and then Erica, and then Jory and me. So we had a great time together, and uh, I read a lot of books. I did a lot of online study of what other churches are doing uh, this year, and uh, uh, we went to Global Leadership Summit, and uh, that was great, really good speakers there. And uh, um, so Jory and Jamie and Erica will come home on Tuesday. So it's just Cam and me here today, and, well, Tad and Diana, so... Anyway, good to, good, to, good to be back. A number of years ago, I was uh, asked to speak at Young Life's Camp uh, Malibu in British Columbia. And the week went well, and uh, I think I did a good job speaking. And uh, I took Jory and our four oldest boys. And uh, we took the eight-hour ferry ride back from Malibu to Vancouver, and we piled in our van, and as we started driving, I noticed air coming in through the window, the right window. And uh, kind of looked at it and saw that the, the metal on the door was bent, so somebody tried to break into our car. Well, the next year, I was invited to speak again at Malibu, and same group, we took the same boat ride back, and we, uh, we got in about 11 p.m., and the guard at the parking lot announced as we got there that uh, there had been a break-in and a lot of your cars are, are pretty damaged. So I got this sick feeling in my stomach like, oh no, the windshield's going to be bashed in and, um, you know, stuff's going to be taken. And Well, fortunately, our car was uh, spared, but many of the others did not, and they had to go down to report it at the police station. This summer, Cam went to Italy our 21-year-old, and uh, she uh, had her iPhone stolen. And it was uh, in a purse about this big, not very big, it's that purse right there. Hold it up just so we can all, okay, so she's got it uh, around, her, around her neck and shoulder, and it's, it's zipped, and so it means that the thief had to come very close to her, lift it up, unzip it so that she didn't feel it, and pull it out, and then he zipped it back part way. I mean, it's just creepy, right? I mean, why is it that we get a sick feeling in our stomachs when something is stolen from us? I mean, it's not just because we are uh, way too materialistic and, you know, care too much about our possessions. I'm sure we probably do care too much about our stuff. Uh, but I think it's deeper than that. When we're stolen from, we feel like we've been violated. Uh, you know, we've been invaded and, and somebody's, uh, you know, slipped into our life and, and taking something from us. And why shouldn't we feel violated? Because we've just experienced firsthand a breaking of the eighth commandment, you shall not steal. And maybe you're not a believer. You're not sure you believe in God and Jesus Christ being the Son of God and you're not sure you believe this this commandment or any of the Ten Commandments are still relevant today. But whether or not you believe, I want to show you today that when you steal or you are stolen from, you will be affected negatively because it violates your basic design that God has given all of us. This is the eighth in a series uh, from the Ten Commandments called the Original Top Ten. And today we come to You Shall Not Steal. Now, why the prohibition against stealing? What's the big deal? Well, I can think of at least two reasons. One, stealing dishonors people. Do you remember when we looked at the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother? 
that commandment and the, the, the final six commandments are all based on the word honor. It's the rule of the road for the last six commandments. The basic rules were to treat other people with honor. We're not to steal because it shows disrespect for people and their possessions. Uh, we feel angry when someone steals from us because we have a deep-seated need to protect our personal property. We believe that if we agree to leave other people's stuff alone, then they ought to leave our stuff alone. And when that agreement's not kept, we feel violated. Boris Pasternak wrote a novel for which he got the Pulitzer Prize in 1958. Uh, he was from uh, Russia, and even though he won the Pulitzer Prize, it was banned from publication in Russia for a number of years. Uh, in it, uh, Yuri, who is Dr. Shivago, that's the name of the book, um, comes home from the war uh, to his house in Moscow. He has a beautiful house that looks out over Red Square, and it's crawling with young communist uh, members. They've taken over his house. And one young member says, you know, you agree, don't you, that the rich shouldn't have so much? I mean, the communists did this with all the bourgeoisie. They took their houses. They took their stuff to distribute to, you know, the, everybody else. And Yuri's scratching his head. He's trying to be supportive of Lenin's and Stalin's aggressive communist policies. And he says, yeah, I, I guess the rich shouldn't have so much. And they tell him that he's been assigned, he has three rooms upstairs, so he trudges upstairs. They have, you know, he's got his wife and his daughter, and they have three rooms for them. After a while, they take one of the rooms, and then they take another one of the rooms. Eventually, he's evicted from his house. Well, Pasternak saw through this, the communist philosophy, that uh, love for the proletariat, for the people, because he saw that they didn't love him. He understood that you can't talk about, you know, this glorious talk about love for the people when you don't respect individuals. Love for masses means nothing if you don't care about individual people. That's why, you know, communism has collapsed in Eastern Europe today and how it's hurt, you know, countries like Cuba and North Korea and Vietnam and, and China. He saw, Pastor Nick saw that it's hollow to talk about caring for people when you don't care about individuals. God forbids stealing, for he recognizes the importance of ownership of property for the individual. Stealing is evil because ownership is good. Now, not only does stealing dishonor people, but it also rips off God. Uh, we're aware of the communist idea that everything belongs to the state and then the capitalist idea that stuff belongs to the individual but the Bible turns out doesn't agree with either one of those positions the Bible teaches that God owns everything and he simply gives it to us in trust we manage it for him Psalm 24 the earth is the Lord's and everything in it everything in existence belongs to God that means the house you own doesn't belong to you, belongs to God and the property it sits on. The car you drove to get here today belongs to God. That means when someone steals something from you, they don't just steal from you, they also steal from God because he gave it to them in trust. So stealing dishonors people and it dishonors God. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, okay, what's the big deal about stealing? I've never burglarized somebody's house. I don't have any intention of doing so. Let's move on to another commandment. Well, just as it's possible to murder someone in a number of different ways, uh, it's possible to steal in a variety of ways. I'm sure there's many ways we can steal, but let me mention three. The first is seizure of someone else's property. This is usually what you think of when you think the commandment, you shall not steal. Person decides he wants something that somebody else has. 
takes it. Whether he's motivated by greed or envy or anger, retribution, whatever the motive. He takes matters into his own hand and takes what isn't his. U.S. stats for 2016 tell us we have 27 million shoplifters. That's about 1 in 11 people. Shoplifting offends more than the one that it's taken from. It affects the police, our court system, certainly the store owners who have to spend money on security. And the costs are passed on to us, the consumers. Uh, 25% of shoplifters are kids, 75% are adults. 55% say they started shoplifting in their teens. 89% of kids say they know other kids who shoplift. Charles Swindoll in his book, Quest for Character, tells about a woman who was in a store and she was apparently pregnant. Assistant manager was suspicious, so he stopped her and she proceeded to give birth to a chuck roast and salmon and ice cream and candy and another lady was uh, caught on camera uh, going through the store and tapping things and her kids came along behind and then they would grab them and pocket them you know we have sophisticated alarms today we've got moving cameras we've got you know locks on stuff so you go out the store the alarm rings uh, all works at dealing with this problem, but it only seems to grow larger. And the shoplifters aren't the only ones store owners worry about. Many owners worry about their employees. They feel like they lose more through employee theft than through public theft. They fear their allies as much as their enemies. Uh, they're more paranoid by being stolen from an inside job than an outside job. What does this tell us? That many people are very comfortable helping themselves to what is not rightfully theirs. One of the fastest growing segments of uh, stealing today is cyber theft. Identity thieves had a big year last year. 2016, 15.4 million Americans were affected. Uh, they stole $16 billion. Now, chip-based cards are nearly impossible to counterfeit, so ID thieves are moving online using stolen credit or debit card information to buy things online or over the phone. Or they buy stolen information, your name, date of birth, social security number, mother's maiden name, and then they make account in your name. McAfee and the Center for Strategic and International Studies estimates annual global losses from cybercrime last year between $375 and $575 billion. That's a lot of stealing. At the heart of stealing is a disrespect for other people. One of the uh, examples in the Bible of stealing is in 1 Kings 21. King Ahab sees a piece of property that he really wants. It's beautiful grows vineyards and, and, and so he wants it. So he goes to Naboth, the owner, and he says, can I buy it from you? And he says, no. It was handed down to me by my parents. I'm not going to sell it. So Ahab's all mad. Goes, goes home to his palace. He's the king of Israel and he, he's, uh, he's sulking. And in walks his wife, Jezebel. She's a very bad lady. And what, what are you all upset about? And he tells her and She's so bad, she leads Ahab into worshiping of the false god Baal, also worshiping the false god Moloch. They do, you do child sacrifices, babies. She's such a bad lady, nobody, that's why nobody names their, their, their daughter Jezebel today. She says, hey, aren't you the king? Come on, get up, eat. Be happy. I'll have you that land in no time. So she calls all the leaders of the city and she says, she claims a, a, holy, a holy day and everybody to fast. I mean, the whole plan makes you just kind of shudder. She's going to use religion to get her wicked ways. And she says, we're going to seat Naboth in a seat of honor. And then she hires scoundrels to curse, to say he cursed God and he cursed the king. 
And the punishment for that is death, and he's out, and he's stoned. Then she comes home, she says, Ahab, you can go claim your vineyard now. So he goes down and claims his vineyard, and he's supposed to be, he's the king. He's supposed to be the preserver of justice, but he doesn't even ask how Naboth died. Well, then the plot thickens. God goes to the most famous prophet of all times, Elijah. He says, go down and visit Ahab in Naboth's vineyard. He calls it Naboth's vineyards. He realizes it's not Ahab's. It now belongs to Naboth's children. And Elijah says to him, how come you've murdered and stolen and seized property? And then it ends with this harrowing line. He says, just as Naboth's blood was licked up by the dog, so will yours be. I mean, the lesson we learn from Ahab is we never want to want something so badly that we're willing to trample over, trample over somebody else in order to get it. I mean, Ahab didn't even ask, how did Naboth die? What happened? He just hurried down to take it, the vineyard. Never desire something so badly that you're willing to cut corners. Now, another way we can break this commandment, not to steal, is through deception. You don't have to break into somebody's house, take something out of a store. You can simply be dishonest. Jory went to the Arco station uh, by our house on Cornelius Pass, and uh, uh, we go there when, you know, um, we're low on gas, and we, we, we usually just use cash there. And so she looked in her purse, and she only had $7, not much. So she said, I'll take $7. So she watches this guy. He puts in $5. Then he comes over to the window, doesn't even make eye contact. He just kind of mobile $7. Whenever you have a thief, you will always find lying. You'd be hard-pressed to find somebody who steals who doesn't also lie. And she looks at him in disbelief. She says, you only put in $5. And then he says, you know, he's trying to cover his track. Oh, I'm spacing out today. I read about a scam in Chicago. An 84-year-old widow had a leaky toilet. She hired a guy to fix it. And he's going to charge her 70, no, $25,000 up front and then five $5,000 payments. So she goes into the bank, and she, she wants 25000 in cash. The teller was smart. She says, why do you need so much money? She says, well, I've got this guy working for me, fixing a toilet. So she calls over the policeman, who's a security guy. He kind of moonlights on the side. And uh, he, he, he says, uh, do you have a contract? She pulls out this piece of paper, you know, 25000 up front and five $5,000 payments. And there's no contract. So he calls the police. They send out a car, and, and they, they go in, and they find uh, these guys tearing up her bathroom. And they're all uh, uh, jailed for criminal uh, damage to property. I mean, I could go on and on. I read uh, just uh, a, couple, <clears throat> a month or two ago, <clears throat> in 2016, billions of dollars of fraud with Medicaid, turning in bills for services never rendered. I mean, the point is, there's all kinds of ways, that, sophisticated ways, that you can steal. A third way we can steal is through defrauding. That's withholding something from someone to whom it's rightfully due. We defraud the government by uh, not uh, listing all our income or exaggerating on our deductions. Uh, we defraud our families by not making, uh, you know, alimony or child support payments. We defraud creditors when we don't pay on time, when we're capable of doing so. We defraud our employer when we stay home sick, when we're not sick. It's not giving a full day's wage for, or full day's work for a full day's wage. So how do you stack up against this commandment? Are you guilty of stealing by seizure, deception, or defraud, defrauding? Parents, when your son or daughter is caught stealing in a store or in the, in the house, don't 
Don't laugh about it. Don't say it's no big deal. It's a big deal. Make sure your child has consequences. Now, like most of these commandments, it's stated in the negative. You shall not steal. But you can't fulfill this commandment or any of the others simply by not stealing. If that was the case, the best way to handle these commandments would just be never go out of your house, never do anything. All these commandments can include also what we call a grand positive. You have to do something actively to fulfill this commandment. So what's the grand positive, do you think, for the eighth commandment? What would be the positive thing that we have to do? Giving. Let's go with that. Sharing and giving. I think that's uh, really the opposite of stealing is working to make money for yourself so you're less tempted to steal. You have enough and that you can then share with others. You can give. So be generous is the grand positive. Apostle Paul says anyone who's been stealing must keep on stealing. No. Must steal no longer. Must but must work, doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Instead of stealing, we are to work. We're to work to meet the needs, uh, our needs, and and for those of our family. So we're not tempted to steal. And then, so we have to give to others to serve God. So we become a servant of God with our money. You may pass the test of not stealing, But are you using your earnings for God's intended purpose? Malachi said to the people of Israel, you're robbing God. They say, how are we robbing you? He said, by withholding your tithes and offerings. Are you giving back to God the first tenth of what you earn? Or are you hoarding what you earn? I'm convinced that one of the reasons we withhold from God and are not generous in in sharing with other people is because we're afraid we won't have enough for ourselves. We don't trust God's promise that he will take care of us. You ever been to a sale? This could be a a garage sale, could be a a closeout store sale or a sale within a store and uh, people are just kind of climbing all over each other and pushing to get to the stuff. Why? It's because everybody knows I'm, nobody else is going to look out for me, so I, if I'm going to get something, I've got to get it for myself. But if we're a Christ follower, we don't need to think that way. Jesus says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or why don't you read this with me? Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. O you of little faith, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus says that if you put God first, he promises to meet your needs. So teenager, you do not need to steal and dishonor people. Young married, you don't need to steal and dishonor God. Single person, you don't need to panic. Parent, you don't need to hoard. God's looking out for you. Divorced person, you don't have to scrap to get enough for yourself. You can trust God to provide for you. So when you're tempted to steal and the Holy Spirit nudges you and says, hey, you honor me and I will take care of you. You don't need to do that. You can say, God, you know you're right. I trust that you will provide for me so I don't need to steal. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this commandment. Our first reaction is we don't like this command. We don't like any of them. But when we dig a little bit into it, we see that this is really our basic design. We were made this way. We feel violated when somebody steals from us. 
because it's crossing the basic way that you've made us, respect for other people and for you. So forgive us for stealing. We've all broken this commandment. And thank you that you died for us so that our sins can be forgiven and you can give us a new heart that desires to obey you. I want to give you a few seconds to pray. Confess your, any way you've broken this commandment and, uh, and tell God you want to depend on him and his strength so that you can obey him in this area. You pray. Father, thank you for helping us understand why you gave this commandment. It's because it's the way you made the world, the way you've made us. And when we break it, we hurt ourselves as well as other people and you. In Jesus' name we pray.